right now at the airport it's an exciting time we're we're under a year or we're close to a year uh, away from opening the first phase of the new development we're also underway um, we've started and we're well underway on a new master plan so basically we want to keep the airport the same the, the the world class on time the um, view of the citizens and, and this amenity, we want to keep it not only on opening day, we want to have it as a, a world class airport, we want to keep it into the future uh, going the same way. We want to keep our facilities world class up to date. That's what we're doing today. We're, we're here to, um, as a, the first phase of our uh, master plan, this is our first public meeting. And this, there's going to be a series of public meetings. This um, is the, the first phase, which is the inventory and the forecast phase. So we're going to go over um, basically what's at the airport, what are the facilities, and then we're going to go over the forecasting. The forecasting is um, one of two elements in an airport master plan that need to be um, approved by the FAA. The first element is the, for the forecast. The second element in the uh, master plan that needs to be um, approved by the FAA is the ALP. We have a, a great consulting staff on uh, a great consultant on on staff right now that's working on the airport RS and H um, and the exciting news is uh, we've done some work the the forecast um, was approved it was actually approved in my opinion in record time um, based on our work and our relationship with the FAA so um, one one item also of, uh, of note is uh, to those members of the audience here there's a, a a sheet going around please give us your um, name and uh, email address and our contact information as it's going there's also parking validations um, at the uh, back by with uh, Nancy Volmer she's at the back and just yeah. just kind of want to um, introduce the, the format of this first we're going to hear about the um, new development program the, the airport development where we'll have our executive director uh, Bill Wyatt come up and give us a presentation about that. That will be followed by RS and H. Uh, Mr. Steve Domino, our senior consultant, which is he's right here, will start kind of outlining the steps that we're taking. They'll go over the the inventory of the airport and they'll go over the um, forecast, and then we'll kind of talk a little bit about um, the the next steps, the next public hearings that we're going to have. We'll have a series of about four public hearings. We'll have uh, again inventory the next. Uh, meeting after this is, is a really exciting one as a planner. Um, it's the facility requirements. It's when we really start looking at the airfield, um, runway alignments, taxiway alignments. We also start looking at things like the circulation around the terminals, uh, parking, parking, land side components like that. So with that, um, we'll go over those two things. At the end, we will take questions. We have microphones. We'll bring them out to the to the audience and we'll take questions at the end so without further ado uh, Mr. Bill White Executive Director of Salt Lake City Department of Airports Thank you, Brady. evening great to see everybody here uh, as Brady indicated I'm Bill White Executive Director of Airports for Salt Lake City I've been here for about a year and a half uh, I came from Portland Oregon if any of you have flown through the airport there I was Executive Director of the Port Authority, which ran both the seaport and the airport, and I retired <clears throat> uh, comfortably. And three days later, I got a call from Corn Ferry, uh, who uh, were looking for an executive director here. And I began to poke around, and I, I sort of came across this graphic over here <clears throat> and realized what was happening, which is that this community was building an entirely new airport on top of itself. Uh, and there isn't really a place in the country where that can happen. It can happen here because of the amount of land owned by the, uh, the airport. And it can happen here because plans for this uh, uh, were pretty much finalized back in 1996 at the conclusion of the last uh, airport master plan. Airports are required to do these uh, master plans periodically by the uh, FAA because these are facilities that just take years and years and years to thoughtfully plan and to be certain that uh, you don't end up 
uh, making choices or decisions in an unthoughtful way that preclude you from uh, meeting uh, the needs of modern commercial aviation in your community. And so the master plan that you'll be hearing more about tonight uh, takes a, essentially a 20-year look into the future, and you'll begin to appreciate what the challenges of that are. So I couldn't resist the opportunity to, uh, to come here and to be involved with this. Uh, it's really extraordinary. It's particularly extraordinary when you go back and look at the cover of the 1996 master plan. There is a rendering um, on the top of that. It's a document that's about this thick, and it looks a lot like that. 23 years ago, um, the airport staff, many of whom are still there, uh, were involved in the planning effort and were insightful enough, thoughtful enough to imagine what could be. And, uh, and this is uh, really the, the result of that effort. It took quite a while to get um, all of the, uh, the partners on the same page, but back in about 2012 or so, the airlines, the airport, and the other stakeholders, including um, our sponsors, the city of uh, Salt Lake, the mayor and the council agreed. And since that time, uh, the project has been uh, underway. So uh, let me start. The, the initial question may be why. Uh, and if you've flown out of the existing airport, I think you have a visceral feel for that. Uh, the current airport facilities were designed to accommodate somewhere in the neighborhood of about 10 million people. This last year, uh, we had 26 million annual passengers. By the time this opens, we'll be pretty close to 28 million annual passengers. Uh, and even though our staff, I think, does a terrific job of keeping it clean, uh, keeping it functional, it is stressed, uh, to be honest. Uh, it's infrequent that you can get to a bathroom without having to stand in line, man or woman. Uh, the uh, concessions are not adequate, frankly, to serve the volume of people who are coming in. And so if you're connecting in Salt Lake City, it's entirely possible that you get off your plane, you run to the bathroom, which is what most people do, first thing. Uh, and you can't find anything to eat because everything is taken up in their lines and you're anxious to get to your plane. And so uh, those are just some of the physical manifestations of uh, what, what drove the airlines and the airport to, uh, to begin moving in this uh, direction. We have approximately 378 daily departures to 98 nonstop destinations. And we have that because we have a big hub carrier here, uh, Delta. Uh, now, imagine this, Salt Lake City is, the population of the city is around 200,000 or so. The greater metropolitan area is larger. But without Delta here as a hub carrier, we'd have an airport that would have a route network that probably more closely associated Colorado Springs. Uh, and if that is not an airport that sort of jumps to the top of your mind, that gives you a sense. You had many, many fewer uh, nonstop destinations. And so uh, this is really extraordinary for a community of this size to have this kind of network uh, available. We have nonstop European flights, Amsterdam, London, Paris. Uh, we have uh, 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 flights to uh, Mexico, uh, and the president of Delta Airlines, I guess, didn't quite leak it out. He, he said at the Chamber of Commerce here recently that when this opens, uh, they intend to begin service to Incheon, Seoul, which is their, um, <clears throat> uh, Korea, which is their hub, or will be their hub uh, in Asia, which is uh, tremendous. Uh, we're the 85th busiest airport in the world and the 23rd busiest airport in uh, North America, which is pretty good because, again, Salt Lake City as a city is nowhere near either of those uh, in rank, so it, we've clearly overachieved here. Uh, we rank number two for on-time uh, departures and arrivals. This one, uh, to be honest, always surprises me because I have no idea how that happens. The existing layout here is incredibly inefficient for a hub operation. Uh, and I know you've all had this experience. I have, you fly into Salt Lake, the captain comes on after the wheel's down and says, hey, good news, we're here 10 minutes early. And then you begin taxing and taxing, and then the plane comes to a stop out on the tarmac somewhere, and the captain comes on and goes, well, there's a plane moving inside the throat area where we, our gate is, and, um, uh, we're going to be here for a few minutes, and you end up arriving on time. And I think a lot of that 
to be blunt, is that the airlines uh, manage their schedule in a way so that they inflate it a bit uh, so that we do have a great on-time arrival. This new design will resolve that uh, significantly. Uh, we operate in every imaginable climate here. Uh, they're both challenging, both the heat of the summer and the cold and snow of the winter. Uh, but uh, I'm sure it won't surprise any of you, Salt Lake City International Airport consistently wins awards from the various airport associations for snow removal. They're on it. Uh, they do a great job. And at 5,000 feet, which is the approximate elevation of the uh, airport and, you know, 100 degrees, uh, we pay a price on the other end. Uh, planes are often required to take uh, weight penalties in order to be sure that they get up in the air uh, safely. And uh, so uh, that's a challenge. One of the reasons, uh, one of the many reasons for this project is to address the uh, seismic concerns that are associated, uh, associated with the fault along the Wasatch Front. I was a little uh, surprised to learn when I came here from Portland, which is at the epicenter of the Cascade subduction zone, uh, to discover that I hadn't gotten away from our earthquake concerns. And so if you were able to tour the existing facility now without you know, all of the, the drywall and everything that will cover up the massive beams, uh, the scale of uh, the <clears throat> effort to address the seismic concerns is terrific. Uh, and accounts for uh, a large part of the cost, but it's very important. It is being designed to essentially the second highest uh, level available, the highest going to emergency care facilities, hospitals as an example. So we'd be able to actually open the terminal building the day after uh, without uh, injury or loss of life. That's the essential uh, goal of that. Uh, provide right-sized facilities. Um, so the restrooms, for example, uh, so, you know, you don't think of an airport director spending so much time in restrooms, but we spend a tremendous amount of time uh, looking at and helping design the new restrooms. Will be plentiful, uh, substantially more for women than for men, which I'm sure uh, will please uh, many. But very thoughtfully designed so that one half can be closed while the other half is uh, is open uh, for business. Um, <clears throat> the concessions program will dramatically increase the offerings available to passengers and uh, we have <clears throat> uh, kept with what I think is kind of the, the growing trend in airport world which is to use a lot of local uh, vendors, so names that you would uh, recognize. Um, prior to my arrival, uh, very early in the project, uh, the city and the airport went out to the community, the broader community, and said, what is it that you're looking for in the airport? And, and in addition to the things that you would expect, like, you know, bathrooms and parking and access and so on and so forth, people wanted the facility to look like the community so that even if you weren't getting out here in Salt Lake, uh, that you would know you'd been here. <clears throat> and so a lot of care has gone into the fit and finish and colors and materials uh, so that um, we, we give that, uh, that leading impression to people uh, as they uh, move around the airport, as they arrive here, as they come, maybe go skiing, come back. You're going to have a sense of Utah in the new facility. If you've been out there, uh, you can see as you drive around the, just the colors associated and the textures um, with the new building certainly uh, give off that sense. Uh, we want to be able to accommodate growth. And one of the things I've said, this design, once phase one, one opens, and I'll talk about that more in a minute, uh, can be expanded almost infinitely uh, without significant uh, passenger inconvenience. And that's very important. Very few airports are in a position to accommodate that because um, airports, most airports in this country were built in the 50s and in the 60s. They had designed uh, airports for the aircraft of the day, uh, which are not the aircraft of today. Uh, and we were in a position to basically leapfrog uh, just incremental redevelopment and build a new facility uh, that is uh, tremendously flexible and will serve us very well going into the future. Maintain competitive cost. Uh, in the airport and airline world, airlines measure airports in part. There are many measurements, but based on what it costs them to serve the airport. Salt Lake City is, is one of the two or three least expensive airports um, in the country. Uh, this year, we're just closing out our financials for the year. 
uh, and the, the average cost per passenger at Salt Lake City uh, is about $3.88. Uh, JFK, uh, the average cost per passenger is, I think, probably approaching $30, uh, somewhere in that neighborhood, just to give you a sense of the range. You know, you add that on to a ticket to, I don't know, say Las Vegas, which is probably 180 bucks, $30, that would be a lot. Uh, and that would be uh, something an airline would consider uh, when they're thinking about adding additional service. So that cost per passenger is very important. Uh, one of the other and the trickiest and one of the things that makes this project as expensive as it is, is the phase construction. Because we're building it on top of an existing airport, we can't just shut down you know, 60 gates and wait for four years. Uh, we have to do essentially a gate for gate swap and in phase one, uh, the phase that we're currently in, that's relatively simple, uh, not a terribly challenging thing. In phase two, that becomes a lot more challenging because you can see this is an actual uh, rendering and, and layout of what it's going to look like. And as we move uh, to the... This way to the east, we begin taking down and removing access uh, to these gates. Uh, and so you have to be sure that you replace gates in, in a fairly equal number. Otherwise, the airlines are going to say, okay, well, instead of, you know, three frequencies to Denver every day, we're going to have one. Uh, or we may not be serving this place uh, at all, and that is uh, obviously very uh, disruptive. So that uh, is a large part of both the length of time that the project is going to take um, and the expense. Um, phase one uh, will open, um, and everything in yellow here you can see will open on September 15th, uh, 2020. Uh, and we're very precise about the date because once um, the airlines, the airport, and all of the related uh, partners move into the new facility, there's no going back. <laughs> and so we have to be uh, very clear with the airlines in particular about the date and the time uh, of the move. It'll be somewhere in the neighborhood of 2 in the morning on the 15th of uh, September of uh, 2020. Uh, we're kind of hoping that when we do that and turn the lights on, uh, everything works. Uh, and we're obviously working very hard at that. But that's going to be a very, very uh, big moment. And once the first phase opens, all passengers, all local passengers will uh, arrive however they arrive. Uh, they will go through the central part of the terminal building and some will take uh, a, a temporary uh, uh, concourse over to the concourses that you see on the right because those gates will still be in use as we begin taking down the existing parking garage and the existing terminal buildings, which we have to do so that we can begin building uh, the eastern part of concourses uh, A and B. Um, so the, the pieces of the airport that we're rebuilding, of course, are all the concourses and terminal facilities. Uh, the uh, parking garage will be brand new. Uh, it's a 3,600 car garage. The ground floor will be rental cars. Uh, a decision was made very early on, a wise one, I think, that rental cars should be as convenient in the new facility as they are in the existing facility, which is to say that you can actually walk uh, from the uh, terminal facilities if you're arriving here straight into um, the parking garage uh, area where you you'd get your rental car. The central utility plant, which essentially provides uh, all of the heating and cooling for the uh, airport, an elevated roadway, um, and I'm sure all of you who use this airport have had the experience of trying to navigate the roadway in the existing facility, and you're really taking your life in your own hands sometimes because it is so overwhelmed. It just was never intended to uh, accommodate the, the volume of traffic, and the nature of roadway uh, transportation has changed. Five years ago, there was no such thing as Uber or Lyft. They now account for 60% of all roadway revenue here, and that's kind of an industry standard among airports uh, around the country. Um, tracks will serve the new airport at uh, ground level. Uh, and <clears throat> the first phase of the north concourse is uh, in the red dotted lines above will be connected by uh, what we call the mid-concourse tunnel. So it actually goes under a taxiway and then back up. 
Um, it's about a quarter of a mile. It'll be connected using uh, moving walkways uh, in this phase. And I'm just going to take one brief moment here because uh, I think as citizens of this region and community should, should really take stock of this. This master plan, this last one, 1996, that envisioned this, imagine having to build uh, this uh, mid-concourse tunnel without which we couldn't build this because we'd have to take too many gates out during construction and the airlines wouldn't go for it. So our staff at the airport uh, convinced the FAA to give us uh, an $8 million grant to build this mid-concourse tunnel, close it, and bury it awaiting the development of this project, which was back in 2004. Uh, and I'm told that every year the FAA would show up and knock on the door and say, where's our eight million bucks and when are you gonna open that tunnel? And it's open now, I've been in it. Uh, and we will use that um, for the connection between the two concourses until the entire project is done in 2025. 20, uh, um, so phase two, uh, it says 2024, but actually probably closer to the uh, beginning of 2025. Uh, and we'll end up with um, 79 gates. This is uh, something that isn't maybe intuitive. That's approximately how many gates we have today. And you think, gee, how can that represent um, a, an expansion or an increase? And the reality is we have 52 gates that are connected by jetways, and the balance of them are ground loads, which was the operating model at Salt Lake for years and years and years, regional jets where you literally walk out uh, at ground level and then take the stairs up into the plane. We'll have no ground load gates. We'll have all uh, jetway uh, connections because the volume growth that we have experienced here uh, is all being achieved through larger gauge aircraft. So uh, Canada regional jets, uh, 60, 70, 80 seaters being replaced by 737s and Airbus 320s and 321s. And that has what uh, has accounted for the, the growth. And we're gonna continue to see that because uh, Delta uh, uses Salt Lake and, and their connection to Salt Lake is it helps them become a full national airline and with their uh, their hubs in both Seattle and LA which are very constrained and are not going to be able to undertake projects like this so Delta will begin to fly larger and larger aircraft between those hubs uh, Salt Lake and potentially uh, further east uh, as well so it is actually a very substantial uh, capacity increase uh, so where's the project now? We are on time. Uh, we have come to realize that um, the world of commercial aviation and the economy of this region look a lot different today than they did back in 2010 and 2011 and 2012 when the, when the final plans were being developed that drove the architectural design, the engineering, and the sizing of this airport. Uh, we use the FAA's annual forecast every year to approximate what we think the growth will be in the following year. And for the last seven or eight years, it's been one to two percent a year. But the actual growth that we've experienced has been five to six percent a year. And if you compound that five, six, seven years uh, in a row, uh, you know, we're beginning to sweat a little bit about the capacity that will be available to us on opening day. And uh, Delta has come back to us on several occasions and say, okay, we know we asked for this, but now we want this. And of course, they bring their checkbook with them because that's how airports are built. And so uh, we are on time though. We have a great project management team and a good a pair of uh, uh, joint venture contractors, including one local, one national, uh, they've done a great job. And so when I say we're gonna open on September 15, 2020, I'm really quite confident that that will be uh, the case. Um, <clears throat> so we've got a few pictures to show you. You can see the elevated roadway over uh, on the uh, right uh, there. This is the gateway center. So if you actually park in the garage right here, you walk into this gateway center, and on this side are uh, rental cars, and on this side uh, there will be ticket counters. So it'll be possible to walk into the gateway, park your car, get your skis, your golf bag, your, your suitcase, whatever, walk in, check your bag right there in the gateway center, and then you walk straight through across these uh, sky bridges 
straight into the security lines at the same level without having to go up or down. It's a very innovative uh, design and there are airport people all over the country who would love uh, to have this kind of a passenger flow available to them, but it's just not because of the uh, constraints of their uh, footprint. Uh, this is the uh, central plaza, if you will, of the airport. So once you exit uh, the security checkpoint, this is what you're going to enter out to. So these ceilings are uh, 45 feet high, and you'll look out to a really extraordinary view. Initially, when you walk out there, you're going to see tails of airplanes right in front of you and the existing uh, concourses, but those will all come down uh, at the uh, end of the project, and you'll have these just spectacular views of the Ochres and uh, the Wasatch, uh, really extraordinary, and then concessions on the right or left, and then here you will go down to the uh, east concourse of A, the west concourse of B, and then eventually there will be a central tunnel that connects to the north concourse or concourse B. Um, if you've flown any time in the last uh, six or seven months, you'll know that uh, concourse A and B have gone away in the existing uh, facility, and uh, I apologize for the confusion, but we're getting ready to open a new concourse A, and so we thought we needed to get people assimilated to that, and so A and B have turned into uh, F and G, uh, which is a little confusing, but we'll get back to A, B, and then eventually C uh, down the road. So on the right is a picture that was taken uh, probably just a few days ago, because I was over there yesterday and it looked a little like that. Uh, and this is the artwork that was selected some time ago. Uh, really extraordinary. Uh, this is an artist who does art at the kind of industrial scale that is required for um, a volume, a size uh, like this. And, and it's intended to reflect the curves uh, and the, uh, the, the look of the canyons of Utah. It'll come with the ability to color it for different seasons. Uh, I think it's going to be very extraordinary. I've been at the artist studio to see the rendering of it. We actually have all of the material uh, on site that is uh, needed. It'll be one of the last things that goes in because it's still an active construction site. Uh, and we don't want it to get dirty before uh, opening day. Um, so uh, upper left, these are the latest, greatest state-of-the-art uh, explosive detection machines uh, that'll go into the screening facility in the basement of the airport. Uh, the bag handling system is virtually complete. We're beginning to commission it now. Uh, there are six of these machines. We have room for one more. Uh, they're purchased by the TSA, and they're in the process now of certifying these machines because we have to run the bag handling system for some time to be sure that it's open for, uh, ready for opening day because that's something that can't fail. And it might be interesting for you to know that the airport more or less is built around the bag handling system. You built that first, you design it first, and then you build the airport around it because it's so central to the operation uh, of the airport. In the center picture uh, are the escalators uh, for people who do need to go up to uh, what is going to be a fairly conventional ticket and check-in lobby. Uh, they will use those escalators to go up and then those escalators to go back down and to go through security. And on the right is a, um, uh, a photo of one of the bathroom units. We started by building out completely um, one set of bathrooms, men's and women's. Uh, and the, my predecessor, some of you uh, may have known, Maureen Riley, who's really got an extraordinary reputation in the uh, airport world, uh, was always characterized to me as a bathroom committee of one. She was really focused on getting uh, this right, and from my sense, she did. But we built out a complete set of restrooms because in the end, there will be 28 of them uh, so that we could have our maintenance staff come in and kind of beat it up a little bit to see uh, if we needed to make any slight adjustments. And we made a few uh, little tweaks, but uh, they're really very thoughtfully done. The stalls are all significantly deeper than normal so that you can bring your bags with you. A lot of hooks if you want to change. Uh, baby changing stations in both the men's and the women's. Lactation rooms in the women's restrooms. Very, very uh, thoughtfully designed. And as I said, we'll have 28 sets of these at the end of the day, so we wanted to be sure that we uh, got it right. 
Uh, we've just done the, both the retail and food and beverage announcements for the first round. Uh, we'll do the second round probably in the 2021 or two range for phase two of the airport. And I must say, I'm very excited uh, about the range of options that'll be available to people. Uh, airport retail is a challenging business today as, as retail is generally. Uh, and so uh, I expect to see more changes down the road as we, um, as we experience those changes. Food and beverage, uh, really outstanding range of, uh, of options and I think, um, I think people are really gonna like it. Uh, the project status, as I said, uh, we have uh, uh, a unique uh, project management system and so we have a project management team that are essentially all private sector uh, people who have lived and worked all over the world building airports and so they work for us for the airport but they are in charge day to day of managing uh, the construction of the airport. We have two different sets of joint venture contractors, one for um, the, the south portion, which is uh, concourse A, the parking garage, the central utility plant, the roadway, uh, and the terminal building, uh, Holder uh, and Big D construction, Big D being a local contractor, and on the other end, Austin, Oakland, Oakland being the local contractor, Austin being the big <clears throat> national firm. And the brilliance of this is that, of course, the general contractors typically don't really build anything. They manage subcontractors who do. And the subcontracting market today in Salt Lake is intensely competitive. Uh, and <clears throat> I get stopped all the time by people tell me, you know, you people are ruining the market here. You know, you're taking up all the spare labor. And I'm sorry, we are. We and Facebook, uh, pretty soon the state prison will jump into that pool. But it's so important to have those uh, local contractors who really know the market and the culture. Uh, they've done a terrific job. And as I said, uh, we're on schedule. Um, the uh, uh, percentage uh, of local Wasatch front contractors is 67 percent. Now consider this is the largest public works project in the history of the state almost by double and to be able to concentrate uh, that much activity in local trade contractors some of which are fairly obscure um, activities if you think about airports and it just so happens we're lucky we live in Utah because uh, the primary producer and manufacturer of jetways is in Ogden. Uh, and so uh, that accounts for a large uh, share of it. Uh, <clears throat> the union versus non-union, uh, this is of course a, uh, uh, not a union state for the most part, but about 38% of the workers are represented by unions, about 62% are not. Uh, and today we have spent about $1.5 billion. The project cost overall by the time we're done uh, is I would say likely to be in the four billion dollar uh, range or so, three three and a half to four billion, uh, and some of that will just depend on the growth that we experience between now and then that we'll want to uh, be sure that we can accommodate. Uh, <clears throat> big question here: uh, Who pays for this? Uh, and uh, I'm tempted to say you're not paying for it, but actually if you fly, you are paying for it. Uh, but no local tax dollars are used in the construction of the airport. And so uh, airlines pay for it through their uh, use agreement with the airport. Uh, we have passenger facility charges that are added to the tickets all airports uh, do. Airport cash, uh, before the start of this project, this airport had zero debt, which I think is I, my guess is of the top 60 airports in the country, there wasn't another airport that had zero debt. And the idea was to hoard enough cash uh, to be able to go to Delta, the primary carrier, and say, hey, we'll throw our cash into this, you sign up for it, and let's go. And that is, in fact, what happened. It's one of the reasons why Salt Lake is and will continue to be one of the least cost airports in the country to run. Uh, rental car facility charges, uh, so the rental car companies pay a facility charge to us for being on the property and for us having provided them with infrastructure. Federal grants, um, those federal grants come from jet fuel taxes. Uh, we get about half back uh, from what is contributed uh, by Salt Lake. In other words, if we send the federal government uh, a buck in jet fuel taxes, we get about 50 cents back in grants. Uh, and. Um, and bonds, so we have been busy selling bonds. We've sold about $2 billion worth so far, uh, and those are financed uh, by 
all of these various sources uh, of revenue. Uh, our bond rating is very high. Uh, the rating agencies with whom I meet and our staff meets on a regular basis have a great deal of confidence in uh, Salt Lake. We have a reputation at the airport and in this state generally for being frugal, uh, which they appreciate. And as a result, uh, the last bond issue, which was just under a billion dollars, we had nine takers for every one available. So uh, we felt really good about the reception of the uh, marketplace. The economic impact of the construction of this locally is greater than the actual dollar value. It's about $5.5 billion, and that's because a lot of those dollars roll over two or three times. So for, new, uh, for more information about this, you can go to www.slcairport.com. Uh, about either the master plan or the new SLC. There are lots of great little tools on there that allow you to really get in and look at it. Um, and I know that we'll have questions later. I'll be happy to answer really any question, but about this in particular. So thank you very much. And are you up next, Brady? Yeah. Okay. Well, very good. Uh, okay. Thank you, yeah. thank you Bill. Um, the next. Uh, Thing we'll hear about is the uh, airport master plan. We'll have a presentation about the inventory in, in existing conditions by RSNH. RSNH is a, they have a local office and they're also out of Denver. They're one of the um, best and um, most well respected uh, airport consultant firms in the nation. They're led by um, Jeff Mishler, who's vice president in the back of airport planning, uh, Mr. Steve Domino, who has um, many, many years of experience. Um, not only was, is Steve one of the best consultants in the uh, nation, he is also uh, a past executive director of planning with the Salt Lake City Department of Airports. So he not only knows about most of the airports uh, nationwide, but he has a, a lot of knowledge about the exact operations at Salt Lake International Airport. We also have Kelsey Reeves in the back and then uh, Michael Becker, who's project manager. So with that, Mr. Domino, come on up. So you're going to have a new airport. What more do you need? Well, that's what we're going to talk about now is the, the next master plan. So what is a master plan? We hear master plans for communities. Well, similar to a community master plan, this is a master plan for the airport. <clears throat> what it is, it's a comprehensive study to identify what the short-term, mid-term, and long-term facility development needs are at the airport. Uh, right now, uh, as Bill mentioned, we're building the airport that was conceived in 1997 time period. If we look at a comparison of some of the analysis that we did for that original master plan, on the left-hand side, you can see one of the many options that we identified. That resulted because of the planning that we did into the facilities that are being built today on the right. During that master plan, uh, we looked at nearly 11 different alternatives, uh, terminal concepts. How m might we expand the existing facilities? Well, basically, we came to the conclusion that the way the airport operated then was different from the way it was going to operate in the future. And that was a, a result of Delta's hub uh, coming to Salt Lake City. Prior to Delta, Western Airlines, and then Delta uh, establishing their hub in Salt Lake City, Salt Lake City was primarily an origin and destination airport. That meant most of the passengers coming through the airport either uh, began their trip in Salt Lake or ended their trip in Salt Lake, either residents of Salt Lake or they conducted business or uh, recreated here in Salt Lake City. As we developed these uh, different ideas and concepts, we evaluated them for cost, uh, impact to operations, user convenience, how might they be expanded in the future, and that's how we came up with the suggestions at that time. It involves stakeholder input, just like this master plan we're doing today just like we're doing this evening with you. We want to hear from the, the stakeholders, those that use the airport on a daily basis. We want to hear from the community so that we can be informed and reflect your input into what we're planning in the future. 
Uh, Bill already mentioned the tunnel that was built a number of years ago uh, in, the in early phases. You can see here uh, the master plan is, is uh, expecting a satellite concourse that would be ultimately connected with an underground people mover system. The question is what happens after this new facility is built? Well, the community is going to continue to grow. The airlines are going to grow. Uh, people are uh, going to want to travel to more places. And as the community grows, the airport needs to be able to respond to the demand that's created within the community. So what we're going to talk about today, we've been doing this master plan now for a little over a year. Uh, and you might say, well, why are we just having a meeting today? You've been working on this for a year. Well, the first year of the analysis is, is doing an inventory, establishing what the baseline conditions are, doing a lot of data connect, uh, collection, uh, putting out tube counters on the roads just to find out how much traffic is, is actually there. So a lot of the first year of our work is trying to understand uh, the financial circumstances of the airport, their capacity to build more in the future, uh, to understand the sizes of all of the facilities that they have today. How many parking stalls do you have? How are they used? How many runways do you have? What's the capacity of those runways? What size planes can be put on them? So during the master plan, we begin the process with our inventory. And that's just basically counting everything that exists today and understanding what the capacity of each facility is. The second step of the, the master plan is to develop a forecast. So once you establish the baseline, we need to know what's coming in the future. So we take a lot of uh, historical data, we look at uh, national data, socioeconomic data, population, income, many, many different uh, variables that we consider to develop forecasts that help us understand what that future activity level might be here at Salt Lake International. Once we develop that forecast, then we can compare the baseline condition with the future forecast activity to understand what the gap is, what the difference is, where do you lack facilities, what are you going to need in the, in the future. So that help us, helps us to identify what the future facility requirements will be at the airport. Uh, after we identify future facility requirements, we then look at how can we provide these facilities? If we suggest that we need more gates in, in the future, where might those gates be? Might they be an extension to one of the existing concourses? Might it be a new concourse? Might it be a, another satellite concourse? If you need more terminal space, might it be another terminal? Well, we don't have the answers to those now, but for every issue, every functional element of the airport that we look at, there are many options and alternatives as to how you might best place those facilities so that they meet the needs of the users and stakeholders and provide the highest level of service. So for this master plan, we've got a number of goals. First of all, we want to make sure that we identify the, the guidelines, the criteria that is going to be needed for the Department of Airports to, to meet the future demand, that we provide a good roadmap, let's say, for where future development should be. If you know where something needs to be built in the future, then you can preserve that land so that you don't compromise it, so that you don't uh, have to remove facilities later, end up costing you more time and money. So the idea is to, to have a very logical plan of how to get from where we are today to where we want to be in 20 years from now. So our master plan is looking at a planning horizon of 20 years. Now, although we, that's the limit of the horizon for the master plan, we look much beyond that because we want to make sure as part of our master plan that we've identified what's the next step. How are we going to expand it if our forecasts are low and, and we need more facility? Uh, as I mentioned, we want to make sure that the master plan meets all of the aviation demand requirements. Uh, one of the most important things as we evaluate the financial capacity of the airport, we want to make sure that the plan that we recommend, the timing of facilities, uh, can be financed by the airport. It doesn't do any good to have a great plan if you don't have the money and the capacity to build the facilities that you're recommending. 
One of the great things about an airport, as Bill mentioned, is that they are financially self-sustaining. They generate the revenues that are needed to develop the airport. So one of the things that we see for airports typically is when we develop a master plan, those master plans get implemented because the airport has the capacity to fund the development that's being recommended. One of the other important things that we want to come out uh, of this master plan and that we evaluate as a goal is to identify what the uh, environmental and socioeconomic uh, uh, impacts might be as a result of the proposed development. We don't want a uh, proposed development that has negative consequences. Now there's always going to be a balance between needing to do something to meet the needs and, and requirements of the community and what consequences that may have on the environment. So part of our process is to identify what those consequences are and to have a strategy uh, developed in the long term that will help to mitigate any of those negative consequences. So as Brady mentioned early on, there are two major uh, results or, or products from the master plan. On the left, you'll see a graphic representation of what's called an airport layout plan. Uh, the airport layout plan is a set of drawings, probably for, for this airport, maybe 30 drawings, different drawings. It shows two important things. It shows where all of the existing facilities are today. The other thing it shows on this set of drawings is where all the future facilities are planned to be located. So it's a combination of looking at the present with a look at the future. The key is how to translate th these two images, how to get from where we are today into the future. The other uh, product of the master plan is a final uh, technical document or the report. Uh, that summarizes all of the analysis that we've looked at, all of the comments that we've received through uh, uh, public interaction and, and outreach and so forth, uh, all of the analysis, all of our recommendations, all of the options and alternatives we've looked at, and justifies why we're recommending certain options over others. So where are we in the study today? As I mentioned, we're already into the study about a, uh, uh, a year. Uh, the study is, is broken up into three essential phases, or three basic phases. Uh, the first phase is the investigation phase, trying to understand what, what makes up the airport today. What's the baseline condition? Uh, that also includes understanding what activity levels are, what the financial capacity of the airport are, what's the environmental baseline uh, at the airport. The second phase of the master plan is identifying possible solutions uh, or ideas of what's going to be needed in the future to meet the facility requirements that are uh, expected based on the forecasted demand. The final phase of the master plan is the implementation phase, and that's the phase where we begin to develop uh, an actual capital improvement program that helps us to identify uh, when, timing, short-term, short mid-term, long-term, when certain facilities need to be built, uh, how much it's going to cost for those facilities so that the airport can then be, begin that process of organizing its, its momentum to work towards implementing the plan. Okay, uh, who's involved in the master plan? Pretty much everybody. Uh, we have established a number of committees uh, with, uh, with the airport. Uh, our main committee is made up of airport staff. These are the technical experts that understand the airport, they manage it, they know where the problems are, they know what works, they know what doesn't work, and they help uh, influence the, the major direction of the master plan. In addition to that, uh, one of the, the things I didn't mention is that we have, uh, as part of our work effort, there are two components. One is to develop a master plan for Salt Lake City International Airport. The other is to do a uh, general aviation strategic plan. Uh, and that's a separate study. And the reason for that is Salt Lake City uh, Department of Airports actually owns three airports. They own and manage South Valley Regional Airport, and they own and manage Tooele Valley Airport in addition to Salt Lake International. In order for us to identify what general aviation facilities would be appropriate at Salt Lake International, we need to understand what uh, the roles of the airports are, the other two airports, so that we can determine what facilities might be best suited at those uh, facilities. Uh, so we've uh, established a general aviation working group uh, of 
uh, board members. We've, we've met with, uh, initially during the master plan, with users, general aviation users as well, to get input from them. We have an airport board working group. The airport has an advisory board. We have select members from that advisory board that we brief on a regular basis so that they understand the analysis that we're going through. Uh, it's, it's not always convenient for everybody on the board to meet together, uh, and so we, we have a, a separate subcommittee. We can brief them, and then they can uh, brief the, the majority of the board. In addition, we have a, a policy advisory group. What's really important in our master plan uh, is that when we're completed that it has the support of the community. That support from the community comes from the elected and appointed officials uh, in the community. So our policy advisory committee is made up of uh, mayors, city council representatives, and or representatives from these uh, organizations. What we want to do is we brief them on a regular basis to help them understand what the progress is on the master plan, what the direction is, what the analysis shows and why we're making recommendations that we're, we're going to be uh, recommending. Ultimately, when the master plan is done, we hope that we will get their support uh, to uh, implement the master plan. Technical Advisory Committee, uh, I mentioned early the, the first one, the Salt Lake City uh, Master Plan Working Group. We expand that technical committee to include a number of the, the technical experts, subject matter experts from the FAA, from the airlines, from the FBOs, from concessionaires. Whoever operates on the airport, they know how they operate. And they understand it better than anyone else. And so we need their input, again, to help influence the direction of the master plan. Community out, outreach, outreach groups. Uh, we are organized to take presentations like this to individual uh, community councils, if requested, so that we can invite and inform uh, other people besides those who are able to attend this meeting. So uh, a lot of times we find out that more people attend a, a community council meeting, it's closer to home, easier to attend, they're used to going to those. And so we've, we've been set up to be able to take messages like these out to these uh, uh, other uh, organized groups. And then this meeting, which is a public information meeting, when we get to a point in our study where we have substantial, uh, uh, helpful information that we're ready to present uh, to the public, that's when we schedule these meetings. Collecting a lot of data of existing conditions isn't meaningful, and, and that's why we didn't have meetings earlier. But we are to a point where we have some forecast information. The FAA has already approved it, which is an important thing, and I'll talk about that uh, a little later. Uh, but we have information that now we can begin to share with the community. As we go through our facility requirements uh, analysis and our alternatives, we'll again bring that information and that analysis to the public in these, these forums. So how did our study begin? You know, what guides our study? Well, the study is guided by our stakeholders. <clears throat> we began this study by understanding uh, what works well at the airport and what doesn't work. What are the problems? Well, how do we know what the problems are as a consultant? Well, I use this airport all the time, and I know some of the problems. Uh, but FAA knows even more, and the maintenance crews know even more, and the operations people know more. And so we bring together all of these stakeholders that have intimate knowledge of certain uh, functional areas of the airport to understand, to pick their brains and understand where they see problems. Where in the industry, what other airports do they visit that they think that same level of service or that type of facility should be at Salt Lake City. What areas of the airfield are not working well? What pavements are failing? Uh, if our, as we develop a capital improvement program, we need to include pavement maintenance. And so we need to know areas on the, the airfield that, aren't, uh, that are beginning to fail or may need to be rehabilitated or reconstructed in the next 20 years. So we bring all of these different stakeholders together. Uh, it was basically a, a, a brainstorming session. We had these boards up, uh, uh, open forum. People were able to ask questions and say, we've got a problem with this. We need to look at this. And that's what we did. As I mentioned, we brought in general aviation users, airlines, FAA, uh, policy advisory group, uh, airport staff, anyone that we thought would have valuable information that would help inform the direction that this master plan should take. So with all of this information that, that comes from these three days of, of visioning sessions, uh, we can summarize them into 
uh, functional categories at the airport. And these are uh, a list of the areas that we looked at, air side, land side, uh, environmental, uh, financial, general aviation. And we begin now to take all of the comments that people provided and said, we have issues here, you need to look at this. And now we can organize them into these different functional areas at the airport and begin evaluating how to address each of these concerns that our stakeholders raised. Uh, this is a result of uh, a graphic that shows some of the areas that uh, our stakeholders told us we have problems. Uh, we've got issues with runways. Uh, F one of the things the FAA does frequently to help improve safety at airports is they update their standards. When, when they uh, uh, become more aware of a particular incident that may have occurred at one airport or another, they revise their standards to try to uh, solve that problem and make airports safer. Uh, as we went through our uh, uh, inventory uh, session, we identified a number of deficiencies uh, that occur today, as well as some that, based on our forecast, we know are going to be problems in the future. So this is just a, a, a general area of things that we're going to be evaluating during the master plan uh, uh, and coming up with different alternatives of how to address each of these issues. So uh, to, to get into the inventory a little bit more, uh, basically what we're doing is we're documenting what exists today. Uh, one of the critical elements of an airport is the, the airfield infrastructure, the runways, taxiway system, and so forth. We need to know what the lengths of the taxiways are, what the widths, same for the runways. What's the pavement capacity? How, how heavy of an aircraft can work on those uh, pavements? Uh, what type of uh, pavement is it? What's the condition of the pavement? What type of lighting system is at the airport or serving each of the taxiways and runways? What nav aids are there? So it's basically, again, just an inventory of everything that's there. And based on this, it establishes that uh, baseline so that when we identify what the future aircraft, uh, critical aircraft might be, we can then address whether any of these facilities need to be upgraded in the future. One of the, the real key elements of this master plan is we are at this point, uh, we're, we're at a turn. So we're operating in existing facilities today, concourses F, G, C, D, E. I had to keep all of those in, in mind. <laughs> so, uh, but that's what we're operating today. Typically a master plan would begin with your existing conditions where you are today. So it would be those facilities. Well, by the time this master plan's done, those facilities aren't going to exist anymore. So we want to make sure that this master plan is current, that this master plan reflects what's going to be needed in the future. So one of the things that we did for this master plan is we took the design criteria for the facilities that are being built today, and we said, that's our existing condition. We know they're not open yet, but that's going to be what's existing by the time this master plan's done. So we use that, the dimensions of those, the capacities of those, to help us guide uh, and compare with what our future requirements might be. Uh, this is just some of the data regarding uh, the terminal area that's going to be open. Uh, 78 gates, uh, nearly a million square feet. Uh, we, we know the land side has problems. Uh, if you think of the, the airport land side, it's constrained with the terminal on the north, runways on east and west, and a canal and freeway to the south. There's not a whole lot of space to provide for the next 20 years, 40 years, or whatever it may be for this airport. So part of this master plan is to identify how are we going to address the land side requirements as well for the airport. One of the things as part of our inventory is we also evaluate the airspace. We, we understand what the terrain is uh, around the airport. This just represents uh, some of the airspace uh, the airspace structure, I'll say, or the uh, uh, elevations that aircraft are allowed to fly as they come into uh, Salt Lake. So uh, what's important is we've developed a forecast. It's been approved by the FAA. Uh, and the way we develop the forecast is we, we do a multiple regression analysis. We do a top-down, a bottom-up. Uh, we do Monte Carlo evaluations. We, we look at national trends. We look at local trends. We look at any type of socioeconomic data that might influence the activity here at Salt Lake. We look at uh, projected population growth, projected income. Uh, all of these variables tend to affect 
what might happen uh, in the community. And again, the master plan is being responsive to the community. So as the community grows, the airport will need to grow uh, to support the needs of the community. The master plan was approved May 1, uh, and that's a, a great accomplishment because we are not able to proceed uh, with further analysis in the, in the master plan and identifying what the facility requirements are uh, and uh, alternatives unless we know that the FAA agrees with our assessment of what the future is for the airport. So that's a significant thing. And by requirement, uh, the FAA requires that we be within a certain percentage of their forecast that they prepare for each airport. Uh, and so we've done that. All right, so as we develop our forecast, the forecast is based on who uses the airport. So what's the service airport or service area for Salt Lake International? Well, typically the service area for Salt Lake International is northern Utah, southern Idaho, western Wyoming. In addition to that, the service area is all of these connections, all of these people that come in from out of state and connect through the airport. It's important that we understand the service area because this is the population from which the airport draws uh, the passengers that go through the airport. What's interesting uh, as we, we look at this particular graph and as we understand any, uh, more about the, uh, the activity of the passengers that go through the airport, uh, the green line represents those passengers that connect through the airport. What's important is we need to understand how each passenger behaves as they go through the airport. Uh, it, it's not important that we know that there's uh, 24 million passengers that go through the airport. We need to know when those 24 million passengers come. And we also need to know what facilities do they use. When we look at connecting passengers, a connecting passenger, someone that flies from Atlanta to Salt Lake to Seattle, never leaves the, the terminal building. They don't need rental cars. They don't need public parking. They don't need terminal roads. And so the facilities that are needed for connecting passenger is going to be different from someone who is leaving from Atlanta to Salt Lake City, visiting the area for business, pleasure, or whatever, and then getting back on uh, or traveling back to Atlanta through Salt Lake. That passenger needs the roads. They need rental cars. They may need public parking. Similarly, if it's a local resident, they're going to need those same landside types of facilities. So what this particular graphic shows here on the left is that the, as a percentage of the whole, the percentage of connecting passengers has been going down at Salt Lake International. Well, in contrast, that means that the percentage of origin and destination passengers, those that either begin or end their trips here in Salt Lake City, that percentage is going up. Again, that helps inform what facilities are going to be needed and where some of the pinch points might be in the future. Uh, the number on top shows the, the percent breakdown be, between uh, origin uh, and destination and connecting. Basically, the airport is about 60% now of O&D and 40% connecting. Uh, the graphic on the bottom is trying to show uh, for each airline uh, which how much of their passenger load is either connecting or uh, origin destination. What you might expect is that for Delta Airlines, the majority, uh, and I can't recall the number, I think it's 60... The left one on the bottom is uh, 57 connecting, 43 O&D. Okay. And the other one is connecting at 9 and O&D at 9 Okay, so, so what we see is uh, a majority of the, the passengers carried by Delta are connecting. Whereas for the other carriers, the majority, and I think the number was about 91%, majority of the other carriers, all of their passengers are uh, origin and destination. So one of the other things we, we look at is trying to understand which airlines serve the market. What's really important for Salt Lake is that you have a hub here, that Delta pretty much drives what's going to be happening here at this airport. Uh, Delta has, uh, between its uh, connection carriers, SkyWest, nearly 70% of the, the traffic here at, at Salt Lake. And that's important because they will influence the facility requirements long term. So as we look at all the different evaluations and data that, that we put together, we, we can put together our forecast. This particular one is a passenger forecast. 
and this is for uh, total passengers. Uh, you can see our baseline year was 2017, and we were uh, just around 23 million passengers uh, at the airport. Well, based on our forecast and our analysis, we, we uh, do a range, of, uh, a range of forecasts. We do a low forecast, we do a mid-range, and we do a high forecast. We don't know what the economics are going to be in the, the next 20 years. We can take our best guess, and we can get all the brains together and, and make our uh, best estimate, but we know we're not going to be right on. Uh, so that's why we do a range. We know economics are going to change every day. Uh, so what we, and, and we find that true at airports is that you may have five years of great growth, as Bill's mentioned, and then it may be followed by an economic downturn and then your five years of, of decline. Uh, but in average, uh, what we're predicting is that total uh, passengers at Salt Lake could grow as, as high as 43 million, over 43 million passengers uh, per year. Uh, when we look at the, the passenger forecast, we need to also understand the difference between domestic passenger activity and those passengers that are only using international facilities because we need to plan for those facilities differently. Uh, they use federal inspection services, customs, immigration. Uh, they go through a whole separate process as they arrive into the country, and we need to make sure that the facilities for them are sized appropriately. As Delta continues to grow, as Delta continues to reach further into Asia, uh, the need for more uh, federal inspection uh, service facilities uh, will probably uh, occur. So one of the other things that we need to understand as we develop our forecast is when do the people come? Well, they come on planes, and so we begin our forecast with understanding what the schedule is uh, for the, uh, the airport. Uh, right now, uh, most of the uh, arrivals and departures, was it 59? 51 percent. So, occur at 11 o'clock during the day, most of the arrivals and departures occur. There's 51 operations during that single hour. Well, if we know what the typical load factor is on an airplane, and we know the number of seats on that aircraft, we can t estimate the number of passengers that are coming on that aircraft. If we know the entire schedule, with 51 operations, coming in that hour, we can quickly calculate the number of passengers that are going to be in this terminal during that time. We can estimate the amount of restroom areas we need, the amount of concession areas we need, the amount of corridors we need. And so it's important that we understand what the peak is. It's useful to know what the annual forecast demand might be, but what's really important is to know when that does that demand occur. Uh, when we project into 2037, I think this is 61. What are four, 60, 63, all right. So what our forecasts indicate is that uh, during the same hour, 11 o'clock, we're gonna have 63 operations. Well, that's gonna put a, a bigger strain on the facilities that are being uh, developed right now. So what's interesting in this, we, so we talk about uh, our a design day schedule, and that's what we were just talking about. What are the air, air carriers, what's their schedule today? And we use that to, uh, as our baseline for projecting into the future what the demand might be in, in, on future days. What's interesting in this graphic, as you can see on the left, that the, uh, the number of operations since 2009 has steadily declined. And we're projecting, all of a sudden there's a turnaround. Well, we can see actually before uh, 2017 that it began to turn around. Well, why might that be? Well, as Bill mentioned earlier, uh, the way carriers operated 10 years ago was they used a lot of EMB 120s, they used a lot of regional jets, 50-seaters, 70-seaters, and so forth. The trend now is to uh, provide larger aircraft. Uh, so these older aircraft are being phased out. They're less uh, I want to say financially efficient for the airlines, and so what the airlines are doing is they're upgaging their aircraft, they're providing uh, fewer frequencies to their markets, they're providing more seats to the markets because they're providing larger aircraft. So as we phase out the smaller aircraft, the numbers of operations goes down, uh, and now as we anticipate future growth, how are the carriers going to respond to that future growth? Well, they've already established that their, their model is going to be in larger aircraft. 
And so the only way they're going to be able to accommodate that growth is with more operations. And that's why we see in the future now projected increases in the number of operations. Uh, we do forecasts for air cargo, and as you might expect with uh, uh, all of the, the online uh, uh, marketing that's being done and everybody buying everything on Amazon and Walmart and everything else, uh, there's a lot of parcels being uh, 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 shipped across the country, and it's going to happen here at Salt Lake as well. And we can see uh, the need for uh, additional cargo facilities at the airport. One of the important things to understand about our forecast is our master plan looks at a 20-year horizon. What might this airport need in the next 20 years? And we identify uh, what the facility requirements might be needed in short term period within the next five years. Well, five years from 2019 is uh, 2024, right? So, but one of the things that's important is we don't care what year the activity occurs because we know that the economics are going to change and we can't tie facility requirements to a year. What we want to do is we want to tie what facility requirements are to a certain activity level. So what we do is we create what's called uh, planning activity levels or PALs and uh, we take our forecast which is the line and now we identify at certain uh, planning activity levels, and it just happens to be PAL 1 is 5 years from now, PAL 2 is 10 years from now, and PAL 3 is 20 years from now. But the key is establishing what we expect certain activity levels to be at these time periods. Once we understand what those activity levels are, then we can identify what facilities are, might be required when the airport reaches that activity level. The airport does not build until it reaches that activity level. So as the community grows, the airport responds to the growth that occurs in the community and responds to development based on the demand that is materialized. Uh, so we show that numbers of operations in 2017 was about 325,000. Uh, by the end of our uh, master plan horizon uh, at PAL 3, uh, those numbers of operations are expected to go, uh, climb to 435,000. We do a similar uh, analysis for numbers of passengers. As I mentioned earlier, we're at uh, 24 MAP. MAP is short for uh, million annual passengers. So uh, right now the airport is somewhere around 24 MAP, and our forecasts indicate that by the end of the 20-year period, we could reach all the way up to 38 MAP, perhaps even, even larger than that. So what we're, we're going to be doing in our next phase of the, the development is identify what facilities are needed if the airport or when the airport reaches this level of 30 map. Uh, in addition, as we develop our uh, facility alternatives and, and concepts, we identify how much facility is needed in each of these planning periods. So it's not a matter of all of a sudden we're building what's needed in PAL 3. We incrementally identify what the additional development might be in each of these uh, planning activity levels. So uh, how are planning activity levels implemented? What's important to, to understand here is the blue line represents pretty much the demand. Uh, this is basically a, a, a comparison to the, the forecast of uh, enplanement activity or total passenger activity as it, as it climbs. The problem is that your facility capacities don't climb at a, a, a steady rate. It climbs, your capacity is increased when you have major development projects. So when you add another concourse, all of a sudden in one year when that concourse is opened, you've increased the capacity of your facility. So what we do for each of these PALs is, so as traffic grows on the, the blue line or the, the demand grows, uh, facilities are built to provide a higher level of service than the demand that's actually occurring. As demand grows, that d demand reaches a, a point of balance with the capacity of the facility, and then as demand continues to grow, the, uh, uh, the capacity and level of service begins to decline. Or the capacity stays the same, but the level of service begins to decline. Once you reach a, a level where uh, your level of service goes down to a failing point, that's the next time that an airport would uh, initiate another major development program. So we, I, we will identify these major increments uh, at which airport facilities should be developed in the future. So 
uh, where are we and what's going to be coming next? As I mentioned, we've gone through the inventory. We've gone through uh, our forecast. We're, we're just nearing uh, kind of the end of our evaluation of facility requirements. We don't have any conclusions of that yet, but once we get those conclusions, we'll be bringing those to the community as well. Uh, after that, we're going to begin, uh, once we understand how much more facility is going to be needed in the, the, the future, we're going to be identifying what alternatives or options are available to uh, accommodate that demand. So we're going to go through an alternatives analysis. Our community uh, outreach program will continue to be uh, implemented throughout the program. We'll uh, engage of all, all of our different uh, committees uh, that I've mentioned earlier. We'll continue to have open uh, public information meetings like this. It's likely that our next meeting, by the time we get through some of our facility uh, analysis, is going to be sometime around winter, November, December. It could be the beginning of the year, but uh, expect another meeting about that time. And that's uh, I want to say, and I think Brady alluded to this earlier, that's when the fun really begins. All of this number stuff, you know, that's just what's existing today. We want to see what the future is going to be, and that's going to be the fun part. Any questions? Yes, sir. Steve, let me see. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, we now uh, take questions. Um, we're going to pass out mics, uh, so we'll, we'll take questions from the audience, plus um, any questions that we've had off Facebook Live. But. Um, we'll pass the mic to you. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's talk uh, the green line, the airport tracks line. What can we expect in 2020? And let me also ascertain, I am a candidate for mayor in Salt Lake City, and my objective is to have less vehic vehicular <coughs> traffic, it appears, with this incredible plan, there's going to be a doubling of uh, vehicular traffic, and have we worked on that? I mean, as I say, my objective is to have less cars as we continue down the years in the next, uh, by 2020 on 2040, but it seems that we're going to have doubling or tripling the amount of vehicles, and I think that's going to be a problem, sir. Thank you. Okay. Do you, you want to take it or me, Bill? So, my... All right. My understanding, and correct me where I go stray, is that uh, the, the tracks line will connect to the new terminal. Okay? Uh, the, the problem is uh, so w the airport can do all that it can do to develop the facilities to make it convenient for people to use tracks. The airport can't force people to use tracks. Now, people may. Uh, resort to using tracks simply because if it doesn't have available parking and there's no place to park, they're going to have to find other modes. Uh, but that may not be tracks. It may be Uber. It may be Lyft. It may be taxis. So, so we don't know. Part of our analysis to understand uh, where that demand is going to be coming from uh, and what the demands will be, uh, what facility requirements are needed in the future. Yeah, just a couple of other thoughts, too. Um, you know, the, the I think I made reference to this earlier. The world of ground transportation at the airport has just changed radically over the last five years here and everywhere. Uh, five years ago, there was no Uber and Lyft at airports around the country. Now there is. Uh, they are each Uber, maybe more than Lyft, uh, working uh, diligently, if you will, on self-driving uh, technology. We are expanding um, uh, electric vehicle charging opportunities even in the existing facility. We intend to expand that as well. Um, I was notified the other day by uh, Vicki Bennett, who's the city's sustainability director, that all of the Teslas that were parked in front of our charging stations were not plugged in. Uh, just people taking advantage of the close proximity of the charging facilities to the airport. So we're going to change that. We'll adapt to that. Uh, and, you know, the track situation is very interesting to me because I think we do about 600 people a day uh, to the airport on tracks, which seems to me to be very low. Uh, because um, think about these numbers at the airport. Uh, I get a daily email that tells me how many passengers will arrive at the front door of the airport every day. And today that number was about 24,000. There are 15,000 people who work at the airport, right? These are pilots and flight attendants and concession workers, our employees, maintenance workers, uh, et cetera. And then, of course, there are another 
30,000 passengers who are connecting and not necessarily contributing to the air uh, quality issues. So uh, it just seems to me that 600 a day is insufficient, and part of that has to do with the operating hours that are available, because the airport is a 24 by 7 operation, uh, and yet for certain shifts, tracks is not really an option, and we'd love to see uh, that uh, and uh, to see a wider uh, uh, utilization. In Portland, where I'm from, uh, when the MAX line uh, in Portland started at the airport, it was 4,000 a day. Now it's up to about 10 or so. And the other thing I would say, uh, this is a challenge that's challenge that is difficult to fix. This airport is so close to the center part of the city. Every day, uh, I go down uh, uh, 500 south on my way to the airport, and right before I get on the freeway, there's a little dynamic sign that says SLC International, five minutes. You know, if I were in New York, it would be an hour. If I were in Portland, it would say 35 minutes, uh, the same thing. And so um, Uber and Lyft are strong competitors to public transportation. And so it's a comprehensive challenge, uh, but one that we're going to have to fix because the freeway capacity is not going to expand. And pretty soon that will, I think, begin to drive people to look for alternatives. But that workforce would be a great one to, uh, to help get on to, uh, to tracks. Increasing parking facilities, are we going to keep the parking facilities the same, increase them, or reduce them? In other words, more yeah. parking uh, There will be more. Today, uh, we fill up twice a week, and uh, consider this somebody's got a ticket in their hand, and they've got a bag in the trunk, and they drive to the airport, and there's no place to park. And we can't. Uh, we can't accept that. The airlines would kill us, number one, if a, if a substantial part of their um, uh, passenger base was actually unable to get on the plane. So I, I would say this, this particular topic is very hot in the airport world today because um, when we go back to sell bonds, the, the parking facility here is a, obviously a substantial part of the cost. And they say, so, you know, with all the changes in, in the roadway, Uber, Lyft, I mean, all the things that are happening, how can you guarantee that, uh, you know, some change isn't going to occur that will uh, obviate your ability to pay for it? And our, I, my answer to that is, A, I don't really know what's coming. I, if I were that smart, I'd be doing something else right now. What I do know is you can't get to the airport without crossing property that we own, and we'll find a way to cover the costs that we have incurred to, uh, to build it. But I think most people who are building five-story, 3,600, uh, a stall, a garages today are imagining that there will be another use for them at some point in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you for a very instructive um, and informative presentation. Learned a lot this evening. But there is one big piece missing um, that concerns me particularly. Um, and it has to do with the planning and development interface between the Salt Lake International Airport and the proposed inland port. Uh, various scenarios of the inland port. I noticed that um, where on the slide where airport uh, planning issues were identified, the in inland port was not listed as one of the planning issues. I also noticed under the stakeholder um, slide that there was no mention of uh, the Inland Port Authority or Envision Utah. So, and so I guess my concern is that um, assuming uh, if the Inland Port were to go through, um, as the Inland Port Authority is now looking at it, it would significantly increase air freight traffic at least. And I didn't see any provision for that in the aviation. Um, uh, numbers that were listed in the plans. Um, and my concern is that if that happens, then it could put Salt Lake and Davis counties in non-compliance with air quality standards. Um, and it could also lead to not just the human consequences of all the additional pollution, but uh, there are some density issues in terms of infrastructure. Um, and I'm just wondering, I mean, the worst case scenario is that there's a cap put on air traffic because of the aggregate, aggregated traffic of the inland port and the, uh, the international airport such that there is a cap on volume. I mean, the worst case scenario, Delta 
leaves and finds another hub. Is there any place across the country where you've seen two major projects that would compete perhaps for infrastructure and for airspace um, anywhere in the country and how is that addressed and how do you plan to address what could be a real curve thrown at the airport by the inland port? Okay, Thank you. you bet. Uh, so, you know, let me take this opportunity to address uh, something that I failed to mention in my earlier comments, which is just about the environmental footprint of the airport generally, because I think uh, that would be of interest to people. The city council in Salt Lake back in probably 2012 or so uh, required that the design of the airport be such that it would achieve a lead gold standard, not a single building, but the entire airport. And I'm pretty confident in saying this will be the only airport in the country uh, that airport-wide achieves uh, a lead gold uh, standard. And there are a variety of ways that we're doing it. One is it's just vastly more energy efficient. As you can imagine, you're building a brand new facility, you can do things that you couldn't do uh, in an older uh, building. But uh, things that are seemingly small but very important there are thousands of pieces of equipment that are operating at the airport all the time, vehicles uh, on the airfield, the little tugs that carry your bags around, all of that. Um, the airport required, this is, I'd love to take credit for it, but this occurred before I arrived, that all of those vehicles be electrified, and they will be. So on opening day, all the little bag tugs that you see chugging around, uh, which by the way, tend to be um, real polluters, uh, will be electric. Uh, and just to amplify on that, the airport took all the ventilation facilities that would be required to operate internal combustion engines in the bowels of the airport out. <laughs> so if Southwest Airlines shows up uh, with their gas-powered tug, we're going to say you're going to have to park it outside and come in and you can take the bags out to it by hand, uh, which they're not going to do. I'm just saying that. So uh, extraordinary uh, effort has been made to really reduce the, um, uh, particularly the air quality footprint of the airport on the region. And the one that may not be obvious that is the most important, the new design, the linear design, uh, allows for much faster taxi in and taxi out times, which is the number one source of air quality uh, impact from the airport. Just if, if you've got a plane that's standing at the throat of the concourse for 15 minutes burning fuel, it's exceptional. Well, we're just not going to have that anymore because we'll have dual taxi lanes in both directions, so the planes will be moving straight in and then uh, engines off. Specifically to your question. Um, Salt Lake International could handle, uh, I've been quoted as saying this before, and I'll say it again, could handle uh, just almost limitless volumes of cargo without impacting uh, passenger traffic, and there are two reasons for that. Uh, the first is that um, uh, air cargo volume arrives at a time of the day that is very compatible with what you saw here. It tends to be at night uh, when we're less full. Uh, and secondly, uh, think about this. Um, a, a robust international air cargo service from Asia, which is not out of the question, would bring in, um, if we really hit the ball out of the park, four planes a week. Uh, so the volume of actual aircraft activity involved in handling large volumes of cargo is really fairly uh, small. That doesn't mean that it doesn't have economic value, that it's not important, that the inland port uh, won't you know, take advantage of it. it. It does mean that the impact on the airport itself is relatively small. The cargo facilities at this airport are actually quite distant from the passenger facilities, and that is not always the case. Uh, in many cases, just because airports are old and they developed the way they did, the cargo facilities are right in the middle of uh, activity. Here, they're quite far north um, on the um, the west or the east runway or the west runway, uh, and so uh, that isn't a challenge. And I'm not uh, I'm not. Uh, disputing your concerns about the inland port. I'm just saying in as far as the airport is concerned, air cargo is really uh, not a particular challenge for us other than being able to provide the actual you know, physical facilities. But in terms of runway, taxiway, um, I don't see that as a, as a particular challenge. If push came to shove, however, um, over space, airspace, over uh, infrastructure or whatever, would the cities 
uh, air court planners or the legislature's uh, inland port authority have the last say. Could the legislature basically say, you will adapt this airport plan to accommodate inland port? So the, uh, the final word on airport planning belongs to the Federal Aviation Administration. And, um, you know, having spent 20 years uh, at dealing with the FAA. It's a multi-headed hydra. Uh, there isn't just one FAA. There's flight safety and standards. There's, uh, they're a little like the Corps of Engineers. You're never exactly sure, sure which one you're talking to, but they are the final word on, uh, on utilization of airport facilities that have received federal grants. Every time we get a grant, and we've had hundreds of millions of them, me or my predecessors have signed a document, fairly thick little document, guaranteeing that we will operate the airport in a particular way. And when I say particular, it is very um, detailed. So uh, I, I, I say all of that because that affects just about everything we do uh, at the airport. We are in constant uh, touch with them, and we are expecting you know, well north of $100 million of FAA grants in order to complete the existing uh, project, the airfield uh, projects. But I would say if you're, if you're looking at the um, overutilization of the airport by air cargo operators impinging on passenger volume, you're barking up the wrong tree. I just don't think that's an, an issue that's worth pursuing in that particular vein because it, it really is a spec compared to the traffic volume that passenger aircraft play. And by the way, the majority of air cargo coming into PDX comes in the belly of a passenger, I mean SLC, you know, uh, comes in the belly of a passenger plane. Uh, so uh, that's kind of where that's at. Yeah. I would like to add uh, one other comment. Uh, the Northwest Quadrant and the in Inland Port was identified as a key issue uh, during our visioning session at the beginning of the master plan. Uh, earlier we had three different meetings and it was on one of our slides. We were looking for that slide in this one and it's not listed. That's our oversight, but it absolutely is a consideration during the master plan. Hello, my name is Jared Olivares. I'm Ryan Blade, so I don't know if you covered this topic. But one concern of mine is uh, accessibility for air airports and whether or not I didn't see any of that in the plan here. Or, but um, the reason why it's a concern of mine is I use Salt Lake City Airport about two or three times a month. And I fly frequently for my business. I'm an attorney. Um, I fly out of the, uh, across the United States to help uh, other people with disabilities in their law work. Um, it's frustrating to me if somebody with a hearing loss when an announcement comes over the uh, um, a speaker, I can't hear it, and it sounds like Charlie Brown's teacher. And um, I wish there were improvements uh, for sound quality or for people with hearing loss to hear the announcements. Um, when I traveled in Europe, every airport in Europe has uh, hearing loops, which allow uh, people with hearing loss to hear better. Um, and so what, what, what comments do you have with respect to accessibility for the future airports uh, yeah. or people specifically with hearing loss because nothing drives me more crazy than um, not being able to hear the flight. I've actually missed one flight because I couldn't hear the announcement. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that. So uh, long before um, I arrived, but in the very early planning stages, uh, I, the, uh, the city, the airport, uh, decided not to include hearing loop technology in the airport. And part of it has to do with the design of the airport, the linear design because it's, the question is which announcements is it that you want to hear? Because in the current facility, there are multiple sets of announcements going on all the time. And so one of the things that, um, that I'm very focused on is reducing the number of announcements, period, because there are a lot of them that are on a hourly loop. Uh, you get the, you know, the police message about, you know, call in the lost bag or the, and, uh, uh, there are a variety of other announcements that are just on a regular basis which are confusing, I think, to people because the real information uh, is going to come from your, your gate agent or whatever. The other thing that we've done, and it's, we didn't have any really great pictures of this, but you'll be able to uh, experience it pretty soon, many, many more visual cues. Uh, so the gates, for example, <laughs> will have blade signs that will come out like this that will turn color. 
So if it's boarding, it'll be red. If it's late, it might be yellow, if it's et cetera, et cetera. We are also looking at, uh, we have a, a group working at um, Bluetooth technology to see are there ways, because most of the newer hearing aids at least are compatible with Bluetooth technology, uh, so that uh, particularly when you're in the gate area, because that's really when uh, you're gonna uh, need it, um, that it'll just be a more accessible uh, operation. We are trying something for people who are visually impaired, which is pretty neat. I haven't seen it work, but I've heard about it. Uh, it's a service, and if you have a cell phone, you sign up for this, and you hold your camera up, and there's somebody on the other end of the camera telling you what's in front of you right now. Uh, you hold it up to the uh, flight information display, and they'll say, oh, your flight is late, or whatever the, uh, the information is. The facility itself is um, fully uh, ADA compliant, as you would expect, because that's a requirement of law, but one of the things I described earlier that I think is really of uh, use if you arrive uh, in the parking facility, you have the opportunity to cruise in straight to your um, gate on the same level. You don't have to move uh, vertical circulation up and down. We have chosen, this was a decision that was made years ago, but it's one that I happen to agree with, not to employ electric carts. Um, we have moving walkways, and the airlines, um, I think most of you probably have seen this, whether you knew what you were seeing or not, employ uh, third-party contractors so that if you need wheelchair assistance, for example, you call, uh, they'll meet you. The quality of that service is actually improving a lot. Uh, it used to be uh, really challenging. You weren't sure exactly where you were meeting, and now uh, they've improved that uh, pretty uh, dramatically. And of course, um, the, the A concourse that you see there from one end to the other when it's done is three quarters of a mile long. It's long. The tunnel to the north concourse is a quarter of a mile long, and the north concourse itself is just, is a, just short of the A concourse. So moving walkways are everywhere. They're all installed now, uh, covered up so that we don't ruin them in the process, but we're very committed to uh, making sure that we continue to address the latest and best technology for sight impaired, hearing impaired, uh, people who have uh, other forms of disability so that the airport is accessible to everybody in our community. Mm -hmm. I I'm two, two questions. Uh, first one is a lot of airports have USOs. I'm just wondering what they're doing for that, where we have two major bases. We have uh, Camp Williams and then the Hill Air Force Base. Not to mention all the soldiers that leave from Memphis to go to the airport, and then they also come back. That's the first question. The second one was more business related, is on your, um, are your rate for your taxis gonna increase, decrease? Right now, as you have it, you have all these cars that line up, and they may wait five hours for a ride down to Salt Lake and only get a $25 fare for two or three hour wait. So I'm just looking at what you guys' plans are to help out the business for the local taxis, <coughs> not just Lyft and Uber. Well, those are two very different questions. Uh, yeah. uh, we do not currently have plans for USO. They have not approached us. When I was in Portland, uh, we were approached by um, individuals who wanted one, and, and the USO finally went out and raised the money to uh, do it, and they're obligated to do that. Despite the fact that we have two bases here, we have relatively few actual departures on our side of the airfield. Many times they leave uh, from the other side. Uh, and I think a lot of airports would tell you the experience, unless they are at a, they're a major, Atlanta would be a very good example of that. Uh, they have a major USO facility and they have major troop uh, deployments from the commercial side of the airport and that's the, I think, the key. Uh, on the, um, uh, the regulation uh, piece, uh, so we have not established, for example, parking uh, prices yet. It's a very, uh, it's a, it's a very geeky kind of thing and we're, we're looking at it. We have competition off the airport, so we have to pay uh, close attention to that. But I would, I would guess that the parking rates will be fairly comparable to what they are today for the level of service. For the roadway personnel, we, ha we do have, uh, and I was somewhat disappointed to learn that the executive director of airports is in charge of uh, 
ground transportation regulation in all of Salt Lake City, which is not the most fun thing uh, I do on a regular basis. Um, I wouldn't expect initially to see too many changes. Uh, one thing to note, the roadway is vastly larger than the existing roadway. It's at two levels and it's much longer. And by the way, you'll get to see it pretty soon because in early August, as you exit the roadway or you exit the airport, now you go through this massive construction site. We have to reorient it people so they'll actually start going through the front of the terminal building as though they were exiting the new airport. It's going to have kind of a, a western fake town feel to it because there isn't going to be anybody inside. There won't be any activity going on, but you'll drive uh, right by it so that we can build the helixes that will be required to access the long-term um, garage. So, uh, you know, in the existing roadway 40 years ago, who was thinking about Uber and Lyft and, you know, all of the changes that we've seen? And so uh, we do have standard charges for people who use the roadway at the airport for commercial purposes, and that's part of how we pay for all of the things that um, we build. And I would say m my assessment is we're probably going to take a look and see initially to see how it's working because I'm pretty confident that when all this was planned 10 years ago we didn't get it right and we're going to have to see how it works but we're very we're going to be very sensitive to all the operators out there and there are many many different kinds of roadway uh, providers and Salt Lake is very unique our rental car business is going up at a faster rate than I'm sure very many other airports in the country and that's primarily because people come here they're not going to take Uber to you know to Bryce Canyon uh, or, or typically even to um, uh, uh, Park City or, or uh, Deer Valley, they rent a car. Uh, and so uh, that business is very, very strong and we kind of want to see how it, how it plays out. And what, because that's a, also a business that's ripe for disruption and, and our key is we don't know where the disruption is coming or how it's going to be disrupted. We just want to be able to adapt to it when it happens. been an effort to include uh, minority businesses in your construction. Uh, I don't know if this is a city project or a state or federal project, and that's my question. Yes. Minority businesses, have you included them in the, uh, the big pie that you have here? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, this is it's a city project. Um, I was I will be honest with you. I was a little surprised when I arrived in Salt Lake to see that there aren't state requirements. Um, but the city has been very uh, aggressive uh, and uh, both not only in the construction but in the retail food and beverage uh, awards and I think we've been very successful. I don't have the exact numbers for you right now but uh, I feel like we really had a lot of success uh, at that. And on the, on the construction front, our challenge at the moment uh, is that there are certain types of labor we just can't get. It's not available, right? I mean, if you're a licensed electrician in Salt Lake County and you're not working and you want to, something else is going on because uh, you just can't find them. Facebook, the airport, uh, and then just the normal uh, construction activity that you see here have just drained this county of uh, available trade labor. It's really a challenging thing and it's it's pushing costs up to some extent, but uh, it's a good question. We are uh, very sensitive. Our mayor has been very clear about this. The council has been very clear about it. We report to um, our advisory board each month when they meet uh, with a sort of a long list of statistics about how we're doing, how many local contractors there are. Um, we can't always identify a DBE contractor necessarily, uh, but we certainly know small business, and that is often a predicate uh, as well. Bill, if I could add, um, we have Raymond Christie, who is our DBE li liaison officer. He's in our planning department. Um, I can get you his contact information. Uh, right now, uh, Raymond would be here, but he's actually in Washington, D.C., uh, because he um, won the National uh, FAA DBE Liaison Award for the United States. So we have an exceptional DBE officer that I can get you his name and number. I just want to tell you about a couple of organizations that I'm involved with. Number one, um, I'm involved with an organization called Angel Flight West. It's a volunteer organization. 
made up of general aviation pilots, and we volunteer our time in our airplanes to fly patients uh, from smaller communities, but generally in the Intermountain West, here to Salt Lake City to receive treatment at some of our world-class uh, medical facilities. Um, the other organization I'm involved with is the Southwest Camel Flying Club, and that's the organization that allows me to fly as a volunteer for Angel Flight West. So uh, in light of that, I've got a couple of questions about uh, the general aviation strategic plan that you mentioned. Um, where is it, can it be viewed, has it been, uh, has it been uh, executed yet? And uh, you know, who prepares it, who has input? And if we have any input, I'd like to see that general aviation is included in the master plan for Salt Lake International Airport particularly, uh, because South Valley is not as convenient as Salt Lake International to some of these world class facilities that we have here. Um, specifically, tea hangers, shade hangers, and anything. Can you address that for us, please? The plan is available. So, um, as the first part of this master plan, we did what is called the General Aviation Strategic Plan. Um, that is available and we can send it to you. It basically analyzes the airport system as a whole because, as we said, we have um, uh, South Valley Regional Airport, we have Tooele Valley Airport, and we have Salt Lake International Airport. And it, it is basically how do we accommodate all the general aviation needs within that community and within our system. So I can get you a copy of that if, if, you're, if you have your name and number. Um, there also is a component to this master plan, the, the Salt Lake International Master Plan right now, um, which will deal with G general aviation facilities. We'll have a public, it'll be part of a, a public hearing in the future. Um, and then as a planner, um, I don't have a very up-to-date master plans for South Valley Regional Airport and Tooele Valley Airport. And as I've told Bill and uh, the RSNH team and the FAA that I fully intend to roll like day, um, you know, in, in a year we finish this plan, the next day we start master plans for both facilities. So um, I guess the overriding question is, is the plan to kick general aviation out of Salt Lake International no. No. or will we always be part uh, of it? you'll always be part of the master plan. General aviation will always be accommodated within every airport of the system. So there, as part of this plan, there may be improvements to T hangers and J hangers for, for small aircraft. You know, um, when you say general aviation, it's a big word, well, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we have two um, FBOs, which by the way, is a terrific thing for an airport this size to have two very competitive FBOs. I think uh, part of the work that Steve and his crew are doing right now is um, just looking at volume. 1735 has, which is a, the GA runway, for those of you who aren't geeked out on runway numbers and so forth, um, is, as you I know can experience, uh, is increasingly getting pressure from the commercial side of the airport. And that isn't going to stop from what I can see. Uh, so as uh, as Delta and the other carriers move increasingly to um, for away from CRJs to the Embraer 175s, uh, slightly uh, bigger aircraft but also longer range, um, we're going to see many more nonstop markets uh, being addressed. I, I, I give you one because it's my favorite. I, I've been asked to uh, go visit with EDC Utah about a company they were trying to attract here, and they wanted this guy wanted to talk about air service, and I said, "Oh, good, I'm." I'm you know, I'm ready for that. And he goes, I only have one question. He says, can I get to Little Rock, Arkansas? And the answer is not really. Uh, you have to fly through Atlanta. You have to fly 500 miles over and fly back uh, because there isn't really an aircraft type that would address uh, the market sizes. The E-175 would do that. And so I would expect to see a over the next five or six years, a significant number of new markets. And that is going to put additional pressure on uh, 1735. I don't know how much. I don't know what it means. That's part of what this uh, process is all about. But if you're in a Cessna 172 and you're sitting at the end of the runway and there is a 400-mile stream of A321s coming in, A, you're going to burn a lot of fuel sitting there waiting for a, a spot. 
uh, and to the extent that there is conflict, um, you know, Big D uh, is going to get pretty upset about it, and we have to pay attention to that. And that's part of what this process is so important for, because I can sit here and talk about all this, but I don't really know uh, what that means. Yeah. Into account because I think it's very important. The flights and, and the flight training and the CAP and all yeah. those things that, that light aircraft are involved in are part of this community and we want to remain part of this community. I appreciate that. And, and you know, uh, I came from an airport where we also had two reliever airports, Hillsborough being one, which is actually a, a pretty successful G airport in Troutdale, which, like South Valley, is directly under the flight path of PDX and always a problem, you know. So I. I feel your pain. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I got a question for you. In all of your explanations there, I noticed on the uh, on the ALP, Steve, that you presented. Airport layout plan. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm, an air, I'm an accredited airport executive. I got 40 years in the background. I've been teaching for Henry Riddle for a number of years, mm -hmm. airport planning being one of them. One of the things I've noticed is you're still showing the Westernmost runway, three, which you guys call 34 Prime, which is going to be where the International Center is, that's still on the plan. Plus, you mentioned the weight penalty we had to carry for when we have a high pressure altitude in the summer for these flights to Paris and few other. Uh, there's still, that I noticed on there, the 3,000 or so foot extension to the center runway, 34 right, 1 6 left. Now, one of the things I've experienced and one of the things I've been teaching is any time you shift operations around, that definitely affects your noise exposure map. Okay, the case in being, there were two cases in Seattle when they opened the new runway. When they opened that parallel runway to keep people from landing on Taxiway Tango, by the way. Which, which happened once. Yeah, which happened way, way too often. But the issue is, is it's not so much the fact that it's noisier, it's just more people perceive it as a problem. We all know airports have to get along as neighbors in the community, noise being the biggest issue. Is there any thought if, you know, if that thing out there does go through, you're gonna to have to redo all of your noise exposure maps. And if we lengthen the center runway, three, four, right, one, six left, we're gonna have a different impact on the local communities. So are we going to have to redo any navigation easements or anything like that? And being as it's going to be multi-jurisdictional, you know, you're going to involve Davis County, a few other things, it's going to be a political football just like the uh, Inland Port, which I'm glad you addressed because that, that's you one of the things there that, that we're looking at here. There'll be, and, and the fact that you've alluded to, yes, the industry is changing. You're going to bigger, bigger airplanes. Yep. Stage lengths are increasing, which means bigger aircraft are coming in. And sometimes the A380, which I, you told me, Brady, it would never happen here because I was at your desk. And I laughed when it did happen. My bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I said it will happen. It's the pilot in command who decides where they're going to go. And they did land. But anyway, that, is, there, and is there any outreach or thought about that? Because it's going to be a big problem. Just think back of the Northern Utah Airspace Initiative a number of years ago where they were going to move the downwind leg out over to the east and boy that got shot down. Even so though people yeah. out there that live there wouldn't even have probably seen or heard the airplanes. So and, and it's, a, it's a political problem. So this is this is probably going to be you know 10 or 20 years worth of work you're going to have to do. Neither of us will be around to see it. Yeah. I'm just wondering what you're planning on doing so about that. You'll, you'll notice that um, Bill is talking about the airport layout plan that was, was shown. You'll see that in, in these presentations that we've never shown that runway. And the reason that we've never shown that runway is we're not that far in the master plan process. I will tell you this, that um, when Mr. Wyatt came in and we started talking about the master plan, he said, here's the thing that I want. Here's the thing that you have to do. And you have to squeeze every bit of capacity out of this that we can because we want to put that runway way far out in the future. The person who the person who replaces me's replacement, the reason that it's shown on the ALP is because I've been mentored by pretty uh, visionary planners who 
set up the airport to look like this, yeah. and I want to be able to collect and start purchasing land and things like that. So in 40, 50 years, is that's the time frame that Which I'm we're doing. Well, in, a, in another right. area, the confliction between 1735 and, and the center runway. You're right here. Uh, yeah. Having yeah. been a control. You're, you're right there. You're confliction. dead on. This is a guy. So so Bill has worked at the airport. He, he knows airports inside and out. And he knows the Salt Lake International Airport inside and out. So that's a very insightful comment. In the next phases of the master plan, the next public meetings, what you're going to see is you're going to see what we're going to try and do as is listed as number five here we're going to try and look at alignments and what we could do to squeeze capacity out of this because as, as i talk to people in the community they always tell me that we have two primary runways that are commercial and then we have the general aviation runway so as operations grow we want to gain as much capacity out of the existing airfield and we do everything that we can to the existing airfield without going into yeah, this from an this right way. Yep. There's and still so not going to be able to run triple simultaneous with that runway. And so those are, those are the things that we will we'll be looking at. And as far as the noise and extension of runways, I mean you're looking at a, a full environmental assessment yeah. process. So thank you. Yeah, I had a question back there. Thanks also for this great presentation um, on what is clearly an amazing project. Um, as someone who has long experienced the long lines of restrooms in airports, um, I was really pleased to hear that you are addressing that by expanding facilities and making them more accessible, especially for people who are in a hurry. Um, I also noticed, though, however, you only referred to male and female restrooms. And I wonder, um, whether you have you. plans for gender neutral <coughs> restrooms. And I really am not speaking, uh, really right. asking about single all gender yeah. restrooms, right. which some airports have, often in family to provide you bet. accessibility. So there is, um, I'll try and describe this and hope you can get the visual on this. As you walk down <clears throat> the concourse, uh, every a 300 feet there will be a node where there will be a bank of restrooms across from um, food beverage and retail and it's it was I can say this because I didn't really have much to do with it. it was very thoughtfully designed and the bank of restrooms will include a men's restroom a women's restroom and then what we characterize as a large family restroom uh, there is no prohibition on who can or can't use it it could be someone in a wheelchair for example although uh, both women's and men's restrooms are fully wheelchair uh, accessible. It, it could be a mom traveling with a toddler who just wants to be able to shut a door, you know. Um, and so um, I think those are facilities that would accommodate a wide range of needs, and that was sort of the intention. And those are large, not just a single? No, they're large. They're, they're rooms. They're, I'm guessing they are 10 by 10. They're substantial. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, it'll be different because we have an elevated roadway. So um, I'm trying to find the best place to. Here's the elevated roadway. And uh, do you know? Do you know that The roadway has essentially been allocated already. Although I'm confident it will change because I'm pretty confident when this happened four or five years ago, uh, the world looked different. We didn't get it right, but there is, I would say, uh, well more than double the space on the roadway that currently exists because it, not only because it's elevated, it's also much longer if you consider the base of the terminal. Um, Uber and Lyft, I think, are uh, over in this area. Uh, the commercial part of the roadway is in here. I can't tell you exactly who's where, but um, it's still being developed. It is still being developed. And now, this is the vertical circuit. This is an island, right? So you will not be able to walk from the terminal building across the roadway into the garage if you wanted to run a car for some reason and go up to their desk. You'd have to 
uh, go up in the terminal building, cross the sky bridge, and go down, which you know presents some challenges, to be honest, uh, for policing and roadway management. But just the additional real estate is huge. Uh, and uh, as I said, I can't tell you exactly who is where on the roadway, but it's going to feel like a pretty spacious experience given what people currently experience, which is everybody wanders out into the middle of the roadway to look for their Uber driver's license plate number and gets run over in the process. Fortunately, we haven't had that happen, but you can imagine it. Arrival and departures, will we have to ground transmission, do they have to come out? Arrivals, because right now, if we have arrivals and departure, we can actually combine trips where we unload people and then load them again. Okay, on the, the answer is yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 we can still do a rematch. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So the rematch will be, isn't it? I think the rematch is on the bottom level, mm -hmm. and so the rematches will only be allowed on the bottom level. So Uber and Lyft will will drop off somewhere on, on the bottom level, and that's where the rematch will occur. There are other ground transportation. And other, I, yes. I apologize, yeah. the TNCs, let's talk about TNCs. Well, in event, I think we've been here for three years supporting the airport. Yeah. 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 So um, this airport sits at the edge of Great Salt Lake, which is a globally important bird area, and there's 10 million birds using that lake annually. Do you have any plans for bird-friendly window treatment, uh, lighting, bird-friendly lighting, and so forth? You know, of all the questions I thought I was going to get, it wasn't about lighting. Uh, I thought it was going to be about wildlife management, which is a whole topic I'd be happy to talk about. So uh, I don't think I can actually answer your question right now from the design perspective of the airport. I don't know if there's anybody, any of our troops here who can. Uh, but if you'll connect with me, I'll, I'll get into that. I'll get you an answer on that. Um, wildlife management you know, is an issue. I'm used to it from Portland. Uh, we're in the Pacific Flyway, and uh, it's not something that most people think about when they think about airports but it's terrifically uh, important. We have uh, what I would characterize as a largely non-lethal wildlife management program, uh, but the FAA, and I don't know if you, if you know this, is uh, on the verge of vastly expanding the responsibilities of airports and airport sponsors, which in our case is the city of Salt Lake, which has uh, I came from an authority that had no authority beyond its boundaries, the city of Salt Lake uh, does. And I think those of us in the airport world are all still scratching our heads trying to figure out what this means uh, for us because it's an immensely uh, challenging uh, and difficult assignment, yet it is um, a fundamental piece of aviation safety, obviously. and so. Uh, we, we tend to discourage habitat, if we can, on the airport uh, for obvious reasons, but um, I'm not anxious to, to have to get too far beyond the borders of the airport. Yes, are you, uh, let me ask you this. Are you a Diamond Medallion Sky Club? <laughs> um, well, I, I, I will just give Delta this pitch, but, and then I'll answer your question. Um, <clears throat> Delta is, you know, they're, they're the hub carrier. They're building uh, a substantial Sky Club here. And this is not long after I arrived. They came back and said, let's see, it's, uh, it's 18. The current one is, if you've been in it, is 11,000 square feet, and it's a mob scene. It's just overwhelmed. The new one was going to be 18,000 feet, and they said, ah, we'd like 9,000 feet more, which, you know, you think about a 9,000 foot home, except that um, we were well under construction. And so uh, it will open at 27,000 square feet, including a sky deck, which will be open, from which you can see the Great Salt Lake. Uh, and you'll have great visibility on uh, at least the, um, the well, uh, both runways. The large uh, the plaza area 
and you can't really see it in this rendering, is going to give you tremendous visibility into the taxiways and runways. There is not going to be a general public outdoor space, uh, but with 45 foot windows and really 275 degree views, you're going to have quite um, a different experience than you do at the airport today where you're you're basically just staring at another concourse somewhere. Uh, it's going to be pretty exceptional. I, I have a, another just a comment because I'm a plane geek, and, and so I, I absolutely love to watch aircraft. If you go to the end of this yes. concourse, oh. or the ends of the concourses, yeah. they're fully they're full glass, so you can sit in the lobby, and this view is straight to the runway. So it has spectacular views, not only of the Ochre Mountains behind you, but the aircraft taking off. It is it is stunning. I actually went in there and found myself just kind of standing and watching airplanes uh, while we were going through a tour. And I'm not telling you we're going to do this, but there are airports, there are about four big ones in the country that are experimenting with the idea of credentialing non-flying public to come into the secure area of the um, airport. Seattle is doing this, for example, which I think is a little crazy because they're so overwhelmed by passenger volume as it is, but nevertheless. Uh, and um, I could see that catching on. It's been really popular. And many of you who are plane geeks may remember the pre-9-11 days when you could drive up practically to the edge of the runway and there would be food carts, and, you know, and, and people would sit there for hours uh, and watch them. And the FAA closed those immediately after 9-11. Uh, and airports, I think, have struggled with that. In Portland, uh, people would come in to the long-term garage, park on the top, and if you Google uh, PDX airplanes or something like that, you'll see this guy has loaded up thousands of hours of video onto YouTube. And you'll see everything from uh, Air Force One uh, to the largest airplane in the world that at one time or another have come through uh, PDX. And you know, it probably isn't a huge audience, but there are people who, who love it. And it would be fun one day to be able to accommodate that. I have two questions now. Uh, uh, one uh, I'm going off on his, yeah. I remember living in Portland going up on top of the deck yeah. and just sitting up there for an hour to go to get a jack-in-the-box and they're eating a hamburger watching the planes and never being harassed by the security or anybody. Will we be able to do that here? And my next question is, what are the plans for possibly relocating the Air National Guard off the airfield and maybe the Hill Air Force Base or somewhere else to clear up some airspace and property? Well, uh, I think the likelihood of relocating uh, the Air National Guard is not great uh, since we just signed a 50-year lease with them. <laughs> I'm just, so that was the very first thing I did when I got here was sign a 50-year lease with the Air National Guard. They get the brother-in-law deal at the airport, as you can imagine, uh, and so uh, and they've actually invested a fair amount of money there. I doubt that it's going to change. The only thing that will change their mission is one of these days the Boeing 707 is going to fall out of the sky if they don't get a replacement for it, but that's because that's their uh, primary mission. I think it is very unlikely in the new SLC that you will find a open to the public pre-security uh, deck of some kind for um, close-in um, operations viewing. I just think that uh, the, both the FAA and the TSA are going to they're going to approach this with great caution and care, and I'm good with that, actually. Can we still go to out here like I could at PDX and just go to the top of the and just sit there? Oh, the garage? Yeah, the yeah garage sure. You, you pay the fee, we'll take the, you bet, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we're good. Yeah, come on down. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, since I, this has not been a subject that I have heard since I've been here, but Brady knows so otherwise. As far as the wind generating facilities, typically they are too tall for the airport environment. Yeah. We, we don't have enough land mass, and then we have FAA required services that we have to protect, and that typically discourages large amounts of the Brady, Brady, Air Force Base has got a huge solar farm. Yeah, that's specifically with, yeah, with, uh, you said wind, yeah. but yeah, the, um, Denver, DE, yeah. Denver yeah. does the same thing. 
real estate uh, gives you a lot of opportunity. We are, I, I will say, this is a part of the environmental commitment of the city of Salt Lake and of the airport. Uh, the city is renegotiating their green energy deal with Rocky Mountain Power, which will include, I think by 2022, that, that we as a city agency and really the largest consumer of electricity go 100% green energy by 2022. Uh, and I'm pretty confident this is going to happen. It's a part of Rocky Mountain Power's, you know, industrial scale uh, project down south. Uh, but we're we're very committed to that. Yeah, well, um, we're we're running out of um, time. Take one more question, and then we'd like to kind of wrap this up. Um, we're happy to kind of stay and linger and answer any more questions that that you might have. But um, with the um, we're a little bit over time right now, so let's take one question from this gentleman and um, welcome. Thank you. This has been very informative. I'm wondering, if, so in phase one and in phase two, where will Delta be located versus everybody else? And sure. will there be flexibility in that if some new carrier came in that doesn't presently serve Salt Lake City? And said we'd like ten gates huh. and, some, and some counter space. The, the ten, the ten gates would be hard to accommodate because of the, our, our our rapid growth that we've been kind of alluding to. But um, Delta is pr primarily going to be on Concourse A. The other carriers that serve Salt Lake are going to be on Concourse B with built-in airport along the gates. So in the case of a new carrier coming in, we'll have some flexibility to put in. Um, for additional gates, we'd, we'd actually be able to accommodate that carrier. Delta is actually going to come um, to take some of these gates as well, but primarily Concourse B will be the other airlines, basically the United, Southwest, and the Concourse A, F, Concourse G carriers now, um, and with Delta being on Concourse A. Somebody came in and wanted 10 gates. That's a $800 million project, so they'd have to be pretty committed, I think, to pull that trigger. Not that I'm I'm available. I'm you know, I'm good. Yeah. Well we do actually have an expansion piece on the end of the B concourse so that um, if we wanted to we could uh, expand by up to 15 gates and my guess is before we're all done with this in that 2025 range we're probably going to do it because the contractors will be there unless the business just collapses it would not be sensible to let the contractors demobilize and then have to bring them back again uh, and do it all over again but we don't get too many 15 gate requests like that. okay thank you Thanks. Um, thank you all for uh, Thanks for all your attending help. this public meeting. I don't meeting. need the details. Um, the next on. public meeting will be held sometime in uh, late fall, December, maybe January time frame, or so next year. That meeting will be covering kind of a fun subject for planning, and that's we're starting getting into the facility requirements. That's when we get into the runways, taxiways, and things like that. So really appreciate you guys coming. If you have any questions, there was a link. Um, or give us an email. We'd be more than happy to answer some of your questions. Thanks. Thank you.